Okay, um, great to be here. Thanks for uh, hosting Jack and, and iCord and CIHR. Um, I am talking as an athlete tonight, that's why I didn't dress up like Dr. K. <laughs> Normally I do wear that to work, that type of suit, but not tonight. Um, but yeah, I'm just an athlete tonight, and I want to give you a little bit of my perspective, and, and I have probably a perspective of a lot of my, uh, my teammates um, about some of these topics. So, thanks for introducing uh, cardiovascular control and boosting Dr. K and, and Dr. West. Um, I don't know if anybody, you, anybody was following the London Paralympics, but before they started, here locally anyways, and throughout Canada and North America, these are some example headlines of, in the news that we saw um, leading up to the games. They were pretty much all dealing with boosting and cheating at the Paralympics. And that was because a lot of the great work that Dr. K does, but the media took it a little bit out of context and they kind of ran with it. And, you know, when the media gets a good story, how they like to blow things out of proportion a little bit. But from an athlete's perspective, again, I think I found it pretty disappointing because we, I'd much rather talk about performance and, and athletic achievement and that sort of thing as opposed to cheating. Um, especially when we consider that it really is blown out of proportion. Here's a quote from uh, a spokesperson for the IPC um, talking exactly about this topic, uh, how it is blown out of proportion. So Dr. K mentioned some numbers about uh, athletes at the Paralympics. The, the caveat is that uh, boosting can only be done by certain types of athletes at the Paralympics, and that's with a spinal cord injury above a certain level. There's actually up to 4,500 athletes at the Paralympics in London. It's, a, it's the second largest sporting event in the world, and very, very few of those athletes can actually boost. The IPC, um, it's, there's no data on this. Uh, Dr. K's got some of the best data, actually. Um, but it's only estimated that a hundred or a few hundred people could actually even think about boosting. And, and that's because of their disability, that's because of their knowledge, and that's because of their sport. There are certainly some sports you wouldn't want to boost uh, because it would be detrimental, like shooting, for instance, or archery. Um, so that's, that's something to keep in mind uh, when we talk about these sorts of things. And I love what's being done though with classification. That was some fascinating data that, uh, that Dr. West just showed about how uh, the same class can have such a vastly different cardiovascular response. That's really interesting. I'm actually one of the uh, few wheelchair basketball players that probably are capable of boosting as a, as a T4 paraplegic. Um, that's something that uh, I've I've never really thought about whether uh, some of my competitors uh, have different cardiovascular control than me. I'm sure they do. Here's a, a great picture of uh, Brad Z here. He's in the audience. And actually, he's responsible for a lot of those headlines because uh, Dr. K was being interviewed and they looked for some local color and they found Brad. And Brad loves to talk about boosting and he, he, uh, he was pretty much responsible for a lot, a lot of those headlines. But So Brad's a local... Uh, local very controversial uh, quad climber who likes to dabble in boosting himself, but uh, I kind of told, I told him I'd throw him under the bus tonight and he still gave me some pictures, so thanks Brad. Um, but I want to talk about the more practical issues around Paralympic sport and, and disabled sport. And here's a couple of examples from Brad. Um, for instance, his skin breakdown, you know, that's a huge issue in Paralympic sport is how we deal with skin. Um, not only just sitting on it, but the straps and the way we we strap ourselves into our equipment. And one of the biggest issues in Paralympic health and, and sport is um, muscles and joints. And here's Brad with, uh, with a support for his wrist uh, so he can actually grab his apparatus when he can uh, compete. And uh, there is a paper published on the, uh, the health of athletes and how the medical clinics in the Paralympics deal with injuries and what do they most commonly see? Well, when you get 4,000 athletes together, they most commonly see illnesses such as colds and flus and viruses um, and then disability specific ones like uh, bladder infections and those sorts of things. That's your typical uh, what's happening in the polyclinic. Um, and then shoulder injuries. You can imagine wheelchair athletes, uh, the forces that they put through their arms or shoulders, elbows, wrists, hands. That's, that's your common uh, things that happen, but there's other things too. I'll talk about skin, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And there are breaks and fractures, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of that from uh, some personal experience. So yeah, I thought I would just show you some of the things I've dealt with injury-wise over the years, from some very minor things, just blisters and sore hands and that sort of thing. That's something we all deal with. 
just cuts in Paralympic sport. You saw some of those rugby hits. Um, we play wheelchair ball hockey here locally. That's uh, that's from a, a tumble there, 11 stitches in the forehead. When playing wheelchair sports, you know, those sorts of things happen. It's surprising they don't happen more often. And you know, my wife uh, cautioned me about showing this picture, but I thought, eh, you know, it's only going out on the web. <laughs> that is a, a picture of uh, my hip and leg. And uh, I saw Dr. K for this actually not that long ago. And I don't even know how it happened, but there was some fall that jammed my hip and created this very large bruise and hematoma. And we were concerned that I might have broke my leg, broken my leg, and it turns out I didn't. So I was very lucky. And this fortunately also very cleared up very, uh, very quickly too, but an interesting uh, injury nonetheless. A broken rib, again from wheelchair basketball. Um, you can, th th that was an interesting thing too, because this was an example of actually uh, inadvertent boosting. This happened during a game, and um, again, I told you I can, I can actually boost as a, as a T4 spinal cord injury, and very quickly I, I felt obviously something wrong with my body, and I could feel you know my blood pressure maybe perhaps being elevated and being a little flush and that sort of thing. And, um, but what's interesting about that is that there's no way I could compete after this because my whole body was was in spasm, and that's a, a you know another thing we didn't talk about tonight. But um, you know your, your muscle control below the injury isn't always um, um, behaving itself and. You might even see me twitch a little bit up here or move around. That's best to see that happens in my trunk and my legs. And after this happened, I couldn't play anymore. And I, and I actually had to go to the hospital and get it looked at because who knows what's happening inside from uh, having a broken rib. Turned out everything was okay. I'm just horribly disfigured for the rest of my life now. Turns out they don't fix that. Broken hand. I have a nice plate in my right hand, again, from wheelchair basketball. Um, Fractures happen. I thought I'd, I'd kind of end this part of the talk with this picture of, on the left is Patrick Anderson, one of the greatest uh, wheelchair basketball players in the world, Team Canada. This is after a tournament in Japan we were at a few years ago. You can see all the, the skin damage and road rash and a broken arm, so it was a bit of a rough tournament. And on the right, I just wanted to highlight uh, the shoulder in injuries and shoulder maintenance and therapy that we actually go through. I could not find a single picture of myself with therapist working on me with an ice pack, but I can tell you that, man, that happened a lot. Um, so I found one here of our, one of our local BC rugby players. So moving on, uh, I thought I would talk a little bit about some other issues that we face and, and talk about. And one of them is doping, of course, Lance Armstrong has been in the news quite a bit lately. What about Paralympic sport? Does doping happen? Yes, doping happens in Paralympics too, not nearly as much. Um, but it has a couple of interesting technical and uh, ethical issues too that come with doping and, and one of them I like this quote here from uh, a Canadian medical officer about how Olympic athletes all be the same but Paralympic athletes it's not the case um, so there's some interesting ways around how doping control have to actually test for doping and how they can uh, acquire the specimens needed to do that and the other interesting thing too is therapeutic use exemptions that's where you can get a doctor's note and, and get uh, certified so you can actually take banned substances therapeutic reasons for your health reasons and that happens a lot more in the Paralympics you can imagine for certain conditions and pain, chronic pain being one of them. Uh, temperature regulation is a big issue uh, with many injuries especially quadriplegics and high paraplegics. Uh, here's an example of Sarah Hunter, a, a local tennis player, spritzing herself with water during a hot uh, match uh, in tennis and there's various ways at least try to control the temperature and lower the temperature. There's ice packs, that sort of thing. I, uh, I found this funny picture of myself on a cargo train in the Czech Republic because the rest of the train wasn't accessible, but man, that was a hot day. <laughs> and one of the things I'm near to my heart, Chris, thanks for that uh, intro about the, uh, the wheelchairs, I, I'm very much interested in, in equipment and how it's evolved over the years. And here's a, a great example of the racing chairs evolving over the years to to today where they're at. That was actually, that's Kelly Smith, another Canadian athlete. That's actually a few years ago. They've actually come even further since then with more carbon fiber and more aerodynamics. Here they are in, in basketball. There's a picture from the 1950s and there's uh, 
I have my wheelchair basketball chair, and you can see it's gone from four wheels to six wheels. Actually, for a brief period there, during 1996, that we don't mention, some of the athletes were using three wheels in basketball. That didn't last very long because it's really not very stable. Um, but now we all pretty much use six wheels. Chris introduced us to classification. Um, it's a huge issue in, in wheelchair basketball. You can have classes from class one to 4.5 on class one. Here's the guy sitting beside me, Joey Johnson, who's one of the Canada's class four and a halfs, 4.5. And here's a guy that he can literally pick me up and carry me upstairs. He's done this many times. So there's just a really showing you the diversity of the athletes that compete in the Paralympics and how the classification system tries to equalize that a little bit. And below you can see Patrick Anderson. Here is another 4.5. He's a double below in the amputee. He's at very high speed, probably scoring a layup on one wheel. And that's something certainly that someone like myself cannot do. And, and just going back, we talked first talked a little bit about the controversy of classification. Um, here's something I was watching uh, as a spectator this year in London, or from, from here watching on the web. I saw this fairly uh, uh, Turkey was the first time they were in the Paralympics. And here's a player who's a class one, just like me, who has very good trunk function, and I know that by the chair he's in and by the backrest he's he's using and how he doesn't actually support his trunk. He's able to do that himself, and yet we're the same class. I need a very high backrest that's up to my, uh, really my armpits almost. It turns out he actually got class a little bit higher after the tournament. He got classed up to a one and a half after, but just an example.